Okay. Don't even know how to operate my own camera. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, chapter 18. Now, Okay, the West on the eve of a new world order. This is where the West began to explode. I mean, explode out as far as having a big population and then to explode with a lot of scientific knowledge and scientific discoveries. They began to, well, they began to build bigger ships and they had to have a knowledge of mathematics. Now, if you know anything about shipbuilding, you might wonder, how do they know how much a ship weighs? You know how much a ship weighs if you know how much water weighs by per cubic foot. And then you can figure out, well, the ship has so many such dimensions here. And uh, looked at from the top. And then looked at from the side. It's uh, if the water line. It might be right here. Let's say that this is the water line. So it's at this length, this width, and this depth. And then you calculate, well, how many cubic feet is that? And then you multiply the <coughs> weight per cubic foot, and you know how much, how much that ship weighs. Now, when I was at Lockheed, we had to weigh airplanes by scales. So we put a particularly large airplane, a C-130. We put the front wheel on a scale and the two back wheels, so the back wheels on a scale. Then we add up all the weights on each of the scales, and that was how much the airplane weighed. With a ship, it's difficult to do that because ships don't have wheels that touch the ground, so you had to uh, figure out their weight by figuring out how much water they displaced. And um, again, they had to know mathematics. The study of mathematics all right, led to discoveries in astronomy also. Astronomy is very, very much involved in mathematics. Now, they studied Plato, and this did a lot to increase their interest in mathematics. Plato was a Greek philosopher. Now, let's see, how many of you? When I interviewed for my job at Lockheed, they asked me this. This is a right triangle. If this is 90 degrees, then this is 60, and this is 30. This was, by the way, Plato's favorite geometric figure. This is called Plato's Triangle. If the dimensions of this is 3, what would the hypotenuse be? 4 or 5? That is 6. 6. In a 30, 60, 90 degree uh, triangle, the hypotenuse is twice the length of the base. Um, also, the Greeks figured out the formula A squared plus B squared equals C squared. The famous three, four, five. So if one side of the right triangle is three and the other side is four, three squared is nine, four squared is sixteen, sixteen plus nine equals twenty-five. And you get a square so the square root of twenty-five is All right. excellent, excellent. Three, four, five. Now if you build a roof on your shed or something, even build a house, this could become extremely important. Um, Again, the uh, Europeans have forgotten about this for some time, but they eventually started studying. They started studying mathematics, led to an interest in geometry. They also developed an interest in, unfortunately, in magic. Sir Isaac Newton, the great science we think of, did not know the difference between magic and science. And if Sir Isaac Newton could see any of us use one of these, he would think that we were holding a mystical device in our hands, this magical device that we can use to talk to people hundreds of miles away and sometimes even see their picture. They, we, they can display their picture while we can display ours. And we can see each other as we talk to each other from hundreds of miles away. Um, they would think that this was a magical device for sure, and if you could see our automobiles, I mean, really. Uh, now, 
They also, what really helped the development of chemistry was alchemy. Alright, alchemy is the supposed science of transmuting baser metals into gold. Your physics teacher and your chemistry teacher will probably tell you it's impossible. There are persons who say it was done. And at one time it was done even in the presence of one of the popes. This alchemist got together and mixed some chemicals. And out came the gold. But don't do it yourself. Um, there is, it is believed by some people that at a certain step in the process, when I mean, you mix the chemicals, you boil them, you heat them. I'm not even going to tell you the chemicals, but at a certain process, something happens that can only be called a miracle. All right, my favorite, one of my favorite jokes from a joke book. Step one, step three, step two. Step one, and you wind up with now. Now, okay, this is a bunch of fake formulas, but here's the step two. Then a miracle occurs, and the instructor was telling him, said, now wait a minute, wait a minute, you're going to have to be more specific in step two. Me and a, fellow, a few fellow Lockheed employees used to pass the joke around, yeah, step two, step two. You can't explain how to get from, to get from here to here, you, a miracle would have to occur, folk, but, because, uh, you know, you can't. But it has been done before. Then. Well, um, I'll leave each of you to make up your own mind. Has baser metals ever been transmuted to gold? Again, your chemistry teacher will tell you it hasn't been done, or likely will. There are a lot of people who say that it has been. Again, you have to have a mindset. But you don't know that though. You know how big this world is. Like, there's got to be someone in the world that's done it already. Oh, 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 oh. Like, actually, yeah. And actually, we have a piece of lead in a museum in Europe where the one side of the lead is lead and the other side of the lead is gold. Where the, the alchemist didn't quite finish the job. Like I said, it was done in front of the Pope one time. The Pope, I mean, and the, with the, some of the most educated men in Europe watched as this alchemist transmuted some mercury, lead, sulfur, and heat. I mean, Oh, I, I got to leave that topic. Like I say, everybody who has looked into it has eventually had to put it down. Uh, but, uh, oh yes, the Cathedral of Notre Dame made news. In the Cathedral of Notre Dame was this more than one statue of an alchem alchemist. What does an alchemist have belonging in a Christian cathedral? Good question. I won't know the answer. I've also heard that there's in the cathedral a statue of Jupiter. All right, I've got to leave that, folk. All right. Now, where this was to lead, I mean, it was a mixture of what we might call superstition, mixture of superstition, magic, alchemy, things we don't do today, things we supposedly don't do. The press, though, played a big role. And to think the Chinese had invented the press. All right. Um, Copernicus had an interest in magic along with Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. I want to start with Copernicus. Copernicus came before the invention of the telescope. Copernicus's big contribution was he said, no, the planets go around the sun and not the other way around. The, 
the whole universe does not go around the sun. You know, basically said the sun is the center of the universe and not the earth. Now, he was, I mean, he might have been wrong, slightly wrong. But, all right, here's something, the earth, I'm just going to put earth, The earth goes around the sun. And he said that the earth was a planet, that Mercury was the first planet from the sun, followed by Venus, then the earth, then Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn. He did not know about Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, or Ceres, or a bunch of the other bodies. But the earth goes around the sun every year, once a year. He said the sun does not go around the earth and create day and night, rather he said the earth spins on its axis, and this makes for day and night. Today we believe that we know he was correct. We know a lot more than I did. He was opposed. He started to write his book, but he would not publish his book till after he died because he feared the Catholic Church would oppose him. Um, and the Catholic Church did it oppose that idea, even though other people were starting to say it at the same time. Now, the next one after Copernicus was Kepler. When I was a kid, I used to read a lot of books about space travel. And one of the books said, if we ever go to Mars, we ought to put the names of these men who made it possible. And one of the men who really made interplanetary travel possible was Kepler. Kepler figured out that the planets move in elliptical orbits. Now you probably didn't come here expecting a lesson on geometry. An ellipse looks like an egg, except an egg is smaller on one side than it is another. An ellipse has two focal points. The distance from one focal point to the edge, the other focal point, is the same all the way around. Now, how many of you can follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. One, okay, yeah, that's an ellipse. He said that the planets, as they're going around the sun, they move faster when they're closest to the sun, this is the sun, and slower when they're farther away. Now, the Earth's orbit is nearly circular, almost circular, but in the case of Mars, when you study the planet Mars in the night sky, you know, Mars goes along for a while, then it slows down, stops, and actually backs up in the sky. Well, how can that be? All right. All of you probably experience you stop to the red light, and all of a sudden your car moves backwards. And you hit the brake really hard, you can't stop your car. You're looking actually at the car beside you, which is inching forward, but you think you're going backwards. And so no matter how hard you hit the brakes, as long as that car beside you is inching forward, you're going to think you're going to go and you're going to back into the car behind you. Or if the car beside you is inching backward, you'll think you're moving forward and going to soon run that red light. All of you have probably experienced this at one time or another. But this is what happens with Mars. Mars's orbit is more elliptical than Earth's. That means relative to the Earth, Mars will seem to slow down and actually back up in its orbit before going forward again. And uh, nobody could figure out why, but Kepler spent 20 years researching and finally figured out, hey, the planets move in elliptical orbits and they go faster when they're closer into the sun and slower when they're farther out. He also said the sun is at one of the focal points of the ellipse. What's at the other focal point? Basically nothing. Now, the moon's orbit around the Earth is nearly circular. And the Earth's orbit around the Sun is nearly circular. Now, if the Moon were any closer in, the tides would overtake the land mass and wash us away with a big flood. And if the Moon were farther out, it would not provide enough tides to keep our ocean clean. It's the tides coming in and out that cleans up our ocean as best it is. If the Earth were any closer to the Sun than it is, it would be too hot. If the Earth were farther away, it would be too cold. If the Earth went on its axis faster than any 24 hours, we'd burn up in the daytime or freeze to death at night. 
we brought up an antenna and freeze to death at night. The earth is perfect for life. All right. I'll leave it up to each of you to decide why. Um, anyway, this, without Kepler folk, we could never have sent men to the moon. Without Kepler, we could not have sent uh, unmanned ships to Mars. We have actually, within the last couple of years, photographed Pluto as we flew past it. We have photographed all the planets as we flown past them, whether it be Jupiter, we've flown past Jupiter several times, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and we no longer consider Pluto a planet. Pluto was a planet when a probe left to explore it, to photograph it. By the time the probe arrived 12 years later, it was no longer a planet. Anyway. Um, astronomy, this is important, the first field of science to undergo a transformation was astronomy and it led the way for the development of other sciences, but for many, many generations the science of astronomy was the most developed of all the sciences. Um, and this was to remain true for a while. Now, the big contribution though to astronomy was made by a man named Galileo. Now, Galileo did not invent a telescope. He was the first person we know of who used a telescope to study the heavens. And he made a lot of discoveries. Now, his telescope was crude compared to the telescopes we have today. But even so, he discovered the craters on the moon. He discovered sunspots. He discovered that Venus shows phases like the moon. You have Venus maybe in its quarter phase and its late quarter phase. Um, he also discovered that Mercury shows phases like Venus does. And yeah, he discovered sun, uh, sunspots. He also said that um, the Milky Way consists of a whole lot of stars. It's not just a pathway to the heaven, a path between Earth and heaven, but it actually is made up of a lot of stars. So Milky Way made up of stars. He discovered four moons of Jupiter. Again, if you have even a small telescope and look at Jupiter, you can't miss it. It's the second brightest star in the heavens. And unlike Venus, which can only be seen for a few hours, Venus hugs pretty close to the sun, Mercury even closer. But in the case of Jupiter, you can see Jupiter all night long when it's visible. Jupiter is a very bright blue star that doesn't blink like the stars do. And it's the second brightest in the heavens, exceeded only by the sun, exceeded only by the sun, moon, and Venus. The sun is brightest, the moon is second brightest, Venus is third, and Jupiter is fourth. Um, anyway, Galileo first pointed a telescope to heavens. He was seriously opposed by the church and eventually had to recant, but eventually the church accepted his and Copernicus's ideas. Galileo pretty much nailed the lid on the coffin that Copernicus was right. Without a telescope, folk, you cannot measure accurately the distance between the earth and the moon. I mean, you know, to say use triangulation, I mean, if you observe the moon when you're on one side of the earth, then observe the moon on the other side of the earth, and figure by triangulation how far the moon is, again, you won't get an accurate figure until you have a telescope. Then eventually we got to where we could measure the length, the distance to all the planets, and even the distance to the stars, talk about by the means of triangulation. All right. Um, now, where this brings us up to the idea of why it happened, and the last one of the men I want you to remember, and yes, I, I used to read a lot about these men, Newton. Kepler had no idea why the planets move in elliptical orbits, neither did Copernicus. 
But it has been said that Newton was sitting under an apple tree one day, and an apple fell on his head. Oh, and he got to think on the wind or not. The apple fell because gravity pulled the apple down. Then he looked up and saw the moon. It was, you know, the moon is often visible in daylight. And he thought, wait a minute. Now, why doesn't the moon fall down? So he got to calculating, well, the reason the moon doesn't fall is because it is moving. And its motion keeps it up. So basically, what we've, the point of making this new with Newton, we associate him with the law of gravity. Newton and gravity. The Newton believed in that gravity is what held the entire universe together. And um, gravity was what, I mean, well, the motion of the planets is what keeps them from falling into the sun because they're in motion. And thanks to the, we were able to launch satellites, they even put a space station in orbit. And as long as that space station keeps moving at the right speed, it will stay in orbit. Now, we had a space station in orbit some 40 years ago called Skylab. Some sun material hit the Earth and expanded Earth's atmosphere and with the crazy drag on Skylab and Skylab came crashing down. So what we've done with our present ISIS space station, ISS, International Space Station, we've got rockets attached. If the ISIS space station slows down, the men up there and women will fire the rockets and speed it back up and keep it in orbit for as long as the rockets work. But again, all this is possible thanks to men who, like Kepler, Newton, Galileo, who helped, to, who uh, tried to explain what the universe is and how it works and how it holds together. Now I want to say this about Newton's law of gravity. It works inside the solar system. You get to studying the galaxies and stars and it doesn't seem to work. So scientists have postulated there must be a whole lot of dark matter out there that we cannot see that's invisible, that, that provides gravity, that holds the universe, that holds the galaxies together. Then they notice that a lot of bodies in space seem to be moving away from each other, away from the Earth. So they also postulate there must be a whole lot of dark energy, energy that we can't see the source from, um, dark matter, dark energy. We can't explain. Okay, how many of you have heard this outside of the class? Uh, okay, excellent. Okay, about three or four of you. Good. Good. So some of you then have some idea what I'm talking about. This was the beginning, folk. This was the beginning. Um, one thing that has changed over time. Copernicus believed that the sun was the center of the universe. Today we don't think so. But then the question arises, well just what is at the center of the universe? And from where we sit on the earth, everywhere we look, every direction, it actually appears that we on earth, that our own Milky Way galaxy is a center. Now that can be argued, Now I'm not going to argue with it. Uh, one student pointed out to me, but well, anywhere you are in the universe, where you're standing is going to appear to be the center. That might be true. Um, but And along later came Albert Einstein, who said that all motion was relative anyway. So if you're standing on the surface of the earth, and the sun is over here, and a few hours later the sun is over here, and you say the sun has moved from being low in the eastern sky to high in the western sky, it's okay. It's all relative anyway. Relativity depends on where you're located. All right. In addition, now this is so much for astronomy. The next science to advance was medicine. In the olden times, an old Greek, I'm going to write his name down, named Galen, believed that there were two types of blood. Red blood that flowed through the veins, I believe, and blue blood that flowed through the arteries, so maybe I've got it backwards. But anyway, two types, one blood type flowed through the veins and one type flowed through the arteries. And um, he did not know about the existence of capillaries. So uh, William Harvey proved that all blood is the same blood. It turns blue 
William Harvey has, and it was, when the blood goes into the lungs, the lungs turn the blue blood back into red. Then this red blood goes to every cell in the body and it turns blue as it loses its oxygen. But then it's pumped back from the heart, I mean back to the heart and from the heart to the lungs. Hopefully you learned all this in your biology classes. Um, or hopefully you will learn it if you take biology. Anyway, William Harvey, now, um, the veins and arteries are joined together by tiny, tiny, invisible capillaries. In other words, the blood vessels start out big and they split off and get smaller and smaller. They split some more and get smaller still. Split some more and get smaller still. And eventually it gets so small you can't see. Then come the capillaries you can't see. Then the little veinlets start joining together again. Um, but by the time they go through, if the blood goes through the capillaries, it comes out blue. Unless it goes through the capillaries and the lungs, and the lungs change it back to red again. Red blood, the blood that has oxygen, blue blood, the blood that doesn't have oxygen. William Harvey said that blood originates in the heart, not the liver. The old Greek philosopher said that blood originated in the liver. Harvey said, no, it actually originates in the heart. Um, again, what helped spread these ideas across Europe was the printing press. The printing press made it possible to uh, get a whole lot of ideas cheaply. And folk, nobody reminded me, but it just occurred to me, it's break time. I'm so into it.